Well, good day, and welcome to the Ollie Exchange, where we update our Ollie community on upcoming classes and events. With us today is Dr. Daniel Kenefick, Professor of Physics at the University of Arkansas. Daniel, welcome, and thanks for agreeing to lead your class, Gravitational Wave Detection, Past, Present, and Future. Thank you, Ken. I'm really looking forward to the class. Well, great. Uh, Daniel, I, I think most of us have had firsthand experience with gravity and, and sometimes, sometimes in a hard way. Yeah. But, but what, what exactly is a gravitational wave and why has detecting these waves been so important? Well, it is one of the interesting features of gravity that it's one of the aspects of physics that most of us are, feel totally familiar with. As you mentioned, in our everyday life, gravity is an overwhelming part of our lives at times. And yet gravitational waves are a new concept, historically speaking, only a century old, and even newer in terms of actually being detected. So we have a very commonplace part of science that yet has this very esoteric feature. And it's even a little difficult in a only a couple of words to describe what a gravitational wave is, because one thing that it's not is the, is, what, is the part of gravity that we're most conscious of. A gravitational wave isn't gonna make you fall. Uh, it's not what we usually think of as gravity. Uh, it's not necessarily going to change your weight in any obvious way, which is another thing we think about as gravity. The part of gravity that it relates to most actually is the tides. We all know that the moon exerts a tidal force as part of its gravitational attraction on the earth and that this distorts the shape of the earth, including the oceans. And in fact, if we think about it for a moment, it's logical that the moon is also trying to distort your shape and mine, but the effect it has on, on you and me is too small for us to even notice. But a gravitational wave is essentially a tide that's traveling through space. And that's a, tricky concept to think of, but it does mean that if a gravitational wave passed through me right now, uh, I guess it's only my head that's visible on the screen, but my head would alternately get uh, longer and thinner and then shorter and fatter. And that's actually what the earth does every uh, day as a result of the moon's effect. That's why we have two tides a day and there's low tides as well as high tides. So it's in terms of what it does to us when we uh, are interact with it, it's very much like a tide from a very distant object that is traveling through the universe at the speed of light. Wow. I, uh, you do such a good job of explaining it. That's wonderful. Uh, is, obviously, it sounds like this is a subject that's part of your research. It is, yes. That's what I started doing when I was a graduate student many years ago. My advisor was uh, very uh, much involved with gravitational waves, both from a theoretical point of view, he was a theorist, and also because he was helping to get started the, the projects to detect gravitational waves as well. Uh, and so one of the very first meetings that I had with him and the rest of his research group, he presented us with a very complete and thick looking sheaf of papers in which he had laid out all the things that he thought that we theorists, the kind of people who scribble mathematical equations on pieces of paper or perhaps type programs to solve mathematical equations into a computer, what he thought we could do to help, right? We, we don't build the device that actually detects the gravitational waves. Uh, we don't do anything to make it work. But it was apparent that before you can really appreciate what you're seeing once the detector is built, you'd have to have some idea of what to expect, what it's going to look like. And that was where he felt we could make a contribution. And so uh, from that moment, uh, at the beginning of my graduate career uh, to now, I've been involved in one way or another with this modeling of what a gravitational wave from a distant source would look like. And the typical source that we imagined back then and that now is being seen 20 years later, it would be things like two black holes colliding into each other. Wow, okay. <laughs> now, now you have written and published several books too, haven't you? That's right. So when my advisor, uh, Kip Thorne, who uh, recently won the Nobel Prize for the detection of gravitational waves. Uh, so obviously a very distinguished man. I was very happy and flattered to, to that he was willing to take me on as a student. I can still remember 
uh, as a young person in Ireland, which is where I uh, grew up and where I did my undergraduate degree, uh, that uh, I applied to go to uh, Caltech, which is where Kip was, and that he phoned me to tell me that I'd been accepted. And of course, I knew of him, but had never <laughs> spoken to him before. And I remember that my teacher in Ireland, uh, my professor in Ireland, was so impressed <laughs> that this great man had called <laughs> uh, to talk to me. So we agreed that I had to go. Uh, and uh, when I did get there and, and I started working with him, uh, I did say to him, you know, I'm very interested in the history of science and I would like to do something along those lines. And in Ireland, the tradition is, unlike in America, you know, you, you, you do your core area and that's it. You know, I, I like mm -hmm. to tell people that as a, math, as a physicist, I, I did everything from math to physics, including math physics in between. And that, that was... <laughs> That was it. So I said, I'd like, I know that in America, I can take courses on the history of science and I'd like to do more of that. And, you know, he was a very good advisor because I think a lot of physicists would have said, well, get out of my office. You know, <laughs> I want you to do what I tell you to do. And he, instead of that, a week later, he came back and said, well, I've got the great project for you. He said, there's been a lot of controversy over the years about whether gravitational waves are real. And we're trying to detect them. We're trying to predict what will be in the detectors. And yet people have been skeptical, uh, including Einstein himself. And so he said, I think it would be wonderful if you uh, researched this history while you were working on this field for, as a physicist. And uh, I did, and with such support and encouragement, I was able to go ahead and uh, end up writing a book on the history of gravitational waves. Oh, wow, good. I, and, and folks, you can get that on Amazon, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you've done such a good job of explaining things so far now. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing people in the class really don't need much background in physics for the OLLI class. That's right. The idea of the class is that it's really more of a history of physics class than a physics class. I'm not going to try to persuade you that you'll be able to go join the, the LIGO project by the end of the class. It's more that looking at this rather fascinating history, I, I, a colleague of mine who's uh, for a long time was the only other person in the world who was interested in the history of, of this particular subject, gravitational waves. It was always a very esoteric niche kind of an interest until finally they succeeded and all of a sudden more people were interested. Uh, I remember Heaton saying, I really ought to persuade somebody to write an opera about the history of this field, he says, because it's got everything, uh, personal conflict, um, major controversy, uh, trying to get big, large amounts of money out of the government with people telling you you're crazy and this can never work. Uh, I mean, just to give you an idea of how science fictional people thought this was a half a century ago when the earliest efforts were underway. Um, the very first, uh, I mentioned black holes colliding. Another thing that's been detected is two neutron stars colliding. And the very first paper written predicting that neutron star binaries would be a good source of gravitational waves was by a very famous physicist, Freeman Dyson. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote it in a book on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, he said, if I was an extraterrestrial, he said, I wouldn't do all the things that people involved in SETI say that they're doing. You know, I, I don't think I would broadcast at this frequency, because why would I know that that's the frequency they're listening at? He said, but I'll tell you what I would do if I was an alien with an advanced civilization and industry. I'd park two neutron stars close to each other and use the gravitational slingshot effect to accelerate my spaceships to near the speed of light so I could go across the galaxy. And, and then he said, but if I did do that, Einstein's equations tell me that those two neutron stars so close to each other would slowly spiral into each other and emit gravitational waves and eventually crash. So I think we should build a gravitational wave detector to find out if aliens are really doing this. <laughs> so that was the beginning. We now know that those systems are out there and they just yeah. naturally occur. It's not aliens as far as we can tell. Yeah. Uh, just the, the, all those hundred billion stars in our galaxy, occasionally two neutron stars find themselves very close together and they end up crashing. And so far as we know, uh, they haven't been used as slingshots, but you never know. You never know. It's somewhere yeah. out there, there could be somebody doing it right now. Right. Oh, wow. Folks, th there you have it. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity to learn something that's out of this world. Uh, you'll want to you'll want to join Daniel for his class. There's two sessions. OK, 
Uh, the first session will be held Tuesday, October 19th in the morning from 9 to 11 at Drake Field. Uh, again, gravitational wave detection, past, present, and future. You'll want to come and join this unique class. And Daniel, thank you for coming today and then offering this class as well. Thank you, Jim.